whole thing right here is uh, water resources, ag law, and yeah. a lot of new program in a sense, but it's uh, been around. Uh, I actually worked with him on some uh, taking the presentation I made with some ag uh, forest uh, only succession workshops mm -hmm. all around the state. Uh, we're targeted to agricultural about some estate planning basics and tools and again a, a question I'm pretty informal around here just to raise your hand. Yep. Just to ask if you have a question. So thank you guys for coming out on this Friday afternoon. Let's tell some people in the back. I'm much happier to be here than I am at my house right now. Currently there's a giant hole apparently in my bathroom ceiling there looking for a water leak. So my landlord is getting to deal with that. And it's not pointed out. I, I'm in the Department of Ag and Resource Economics. I work with the Agile Education Initiative. That's all our information right there. Um, we're a collaboration between the Cary School of Law, UMES on the Eastern Shore, and then the College of Ag um, at College Park. We're funded through the University of Empowering the State. No. Keep going. I am a lawyer, as has been pointed out today. None of this is legal advice. I hope we're all good with that, and I'm just going to keep on going. I'm being recorded, so all of you heard me say that if anyone says this is legal advice. Something we do do through the department is we have this blog at agris.umd.edu if you like hearing about estate planning, succession planning, and snafus that will arise when people do not talk to other people about what's going on in the process. I do a lot of showing how this plays out in court cases there. And then if you like the sound of my voice, I read my blog post to you. And you can listen to them and it will save you time. I try to provide for all forms of information and apparently I copied that twice when I put the slideshow together. So as you've listened to everything today, what do you need to be doing in this process? What do you think you need to be doing? Create a plan. What else? Find some experts. What, what's the first thing you need to do? Exactly. Decide what you want to do and talk to people. How many people knew this was going to require you to actually talk to your family? How many people don't want to do this because now you've got to talk to your family? And you've got to talk to your family about a subject you don't want to talk to your family about. My dad farms in Oklahoma. Every year I go home at Christmas and I hear one thing. I need to do a st estate plan. I need to do an estate plan. I've been hearing that for 10 years. He has yet to get past the I need to do an estate plan part. He doesn't even want to talk to us about this. So he is slowly getting into this idea of what he needs to be doing. So where are you at in the process? All of you are probably at different spots. You don't have to point it out, right? But I just want to remind you when everything gets complicated and you're getting frustrated with your family, that's currently where you're located in the universe. So it could be a lot worse. You could be there. You just need to be about right there. But it's going to take time to start the process as we go through this. So today, what I'm going to talk to you about is getting you where you want to go. What type of tools do you want to use in this process? There's a lot of tools we can use. There's a lot of tax issues that will come up. The end goal is hopefully you will develop an estate plan, but you're going to have to talk to people. You're going to have to talk to your family, heirs, other people who may be involved in this process. And some of you may not want to do that. It may not be an easy process to do, but it's something we all have to do. And we'll talk. As we talk about some tools, we'll talk about why communication is important. So developing an estate plan, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands in the room, but if we look at the most recent data, 45% of those over 55 do not have an estate plan. If we look at general and all Americans, 58% of people do not have an estate plan. So if you don't have an estate plan, you're in the majority. If you have an estate plan, you're in the minority. We would like to flip that to where most of you, or most Americans, are in the majority and actually have an estate plan and change that. But it's really hard to get people to do this because it is a lot of talking about issues that you don't want to think about in this process. Because most people do not want to have the conversation with their family as to, well, what's going to happen after I'm gone? You don't want to think about that. It's something we have to get around to do. So when we're developing this estate plan, some things we may have to think about are who's going to take care of minor children if I have minor children to take care of? If I have anybody under 18, who's going to take care of them? 
you have those children and you're thinking about it, everyone, you know, has that family member in mind that they don't want to raise a kid, right? So maybe we should make sure that family member doesn't raise a kid. In some of the tools, there may be beneficiaries that are already designated. Life insurance that we're going to talk about, you already have a, de a designated beneficiary on that. We don't really have to worry about how that property is going to be transferred. We're already taking care of it. And there may be reasons why we want to have life insurance or other designated beneficiary tools. Many people have a power of attorney, either a business power of attorney or a health care executive. So a few people in the room. We'll talk about these. One, just let your bills be paid while you're potentially in some type of care where you can't do this type of stuff. You're incapacitated. The other one is you may become incapacitated, get dementia, something to that effect where you can't make your own health care decisions anymore. And we need somebody to make those health care decisions for How many people have done an advanced health care directive or a living will? It's the most fun document you'll ever read in your life, isn't it? It describes every way you can get, be incapacitated or have new life sustaining treatment, and you have to make a decision. You get to be a decider that day. The will, we'll talk about why that's important too, and some of the communication issues that go along with that. Now I get to the lovely will. How many people have heard of a will? How many people have a will? It's a document that's going to kind of tell how you want your property transferred at your death. I tried to put a clip in here for one person, what their will looks like. It didn't work out, so I guess we won't have that today. I can tell you the clip when we get to the trust. Trust may be something we want to look at in this. It just depends. They're not for everybody. There may be other tools we want to use instead of just the trust. And then life insurance. I put question marks by those because they may not be something you actually need. They may work for you. When we're looking at either trying to pass on a small business, a family farm, something like that, where the bulk of the estate is going to be the business, we may want to have life insurance to help pass on something to make it slightly more equal between the heir that may take over the business and the heirs that may not be associated with the business, depending on how we set it up. You may know who these people are. Yeah. Sonny Bono, Prince, Amy Winehouse, Aretha. What do they all have in common? Who said they didn't have a will? All four of these, or a few more, I could find some more dead celebrities, didn't have a will. Aretha did not have a will. Part of it may be based on the way she grew up, same for Prince. If they're all from the South, they may have not trusted lawyers to develop their estate plans for them. Shockingly, Sonny Bono, no estate plan. She was pretty young. It's not that shocking. She did not have an estate plan. Who is this individual? Snoop Dogg. Why would I put Snoop Dogg up here? Snoop Dogg went on the record in the media a year, year and a half ago and said he does not have an estate plan. He will never have an estate plan. He wants, when he's dead, he wants to be reincarnated as a butterfly and come back and watch his heirs fight over his fortune. That is not a news story from The Onion or any other fake news site that makes up comedy news. That is an actual story. Snoop Dogg actually does have a plan, which Jennifer kind of talked about. In the end, the state has a plan for you. All states have some sort of laws called intestate laws that basically dictate how property is distributed when you don't have a will. In it, for the most part, we just assume you want your property to be divided up among your closest family members. So if you're married and have kids, 50-ish percent should go to your spouse. The other 50 percent should be divided up between your children. Some states will depend on whether or not the child is alive at the time as if they actually get to take. It may go to grandkids at that point. It just depends on the state law. The one thing that we don't take into account is we don't care if you liked your family at this point in your life. You may hate every family member you have at this point, but they're still getting your property. Why? Because you could have made a will and you could have just cut them all out of the property. So if you don't have good relationships with your family, maybe you should think about a will too. So who can make a will? 
I like this quote. You really don't have to be the smartest person in the world to make a will. You just have to be over 18 years old. All you have to be is of sound mind and over the age of 18 to make a will. What happens as we age, though? We do. Anything else? What's happening to more and more Americans as they get older? They're getting dementia, right? You go into the lawyer's office and they can tell you how this is going to go because I go to enough workshops where we have to work, understand this process. You walk into the lawyer's office and you really don't know what day of the week it is. You really have no idea it is. And one of your kids is bringing you into the room and has to answer all the questions for you. How long do you think I'm going to let your kids stay in the room with you? Not very long. And you're going on videotape at that point. Because i got to prove somewhere down the road, because somebody's going to probably complain about this, that you actually wanted this to happen and nobody was in the room to tell you this. And you may not like it, you may yell at me, and you may leave the office, but I'm covering my own butt down the road and you need to be doing the same. So maybe we should think about this before we reach that age to where we can't think it, can't actually do this without prompting from a kid. It's not good. It is one estate planning tool that everyone should at least consider for the most part. They will have some benefit to you for most of the stuff you're doing. Um, trust will fit in here too as well. Even if you have a trust, you still need a will because there's always going to be property that's potentially outside the trust that came up. Can anybody read that? And I know it's on a screen and it's not that big. I'm closer than you guys. I can't read that handwriting. That's a holographic will. For the most part, all wills have to be witnessed, notarized. There's a whole ceremony that goes on when you do this. You'll sit in a room, you'll sign the will, you'll say, this is my will, you'll sign it in front of the witnesses, the witnesses will then sign, and then somebody will notarize it. Holographic wills are one exception to this. The idea is it has to be written entirely in your own handwriting and signed. Before you get excited that this is an easy, cheap way to get around the will or going to the attorney's office, they're not valid in Maryland for any reason. They're valid in other states. You may hear they're valid. They're only valid in one case in Maryland. You're active duty and you're overseas at the time. The idea is you're think, contemplating death at that point. You should be allowed to do a will when you have the opportunity to do it, and we shouldn't require you to get an attorney at that point. The reason some people don't want to do this is they don't want to give up control, which was highlighted earlier. You can change a will whenever you want. If you bring in new property, you make the change, if something happens in the family, and we're going to talk about at the end why you want to consider updating the will, why you want to revise a will, why you want to revise the state plan. You can do this whenever you want to. You can either do a new will or just a codicil, which is an amendment to a will. It'll have to follow the same process. You're still going to have to get it notarized, witnessed, all that stuff. So does that mean you can make margin notes? You're mad at your daughter today, you want to cut her out of the will. You cannot make margin notes, we don't care about the margin notes. We only care what was done in front of the signing ceremony. When we think about this, this is not around to tell us what you wanted when we're actually trying to figure all this out. Yeah, you, unless we can get a Ouija board to figure out how to call spirits at that point, we're not bringing you back to answer questions. So we really need to make sure this thing reaches the highest standard possible before we can kind of deal with it. So we do have a lot of formal requirements with these things that could potentially. Any questions on wheel? So life insurance. So some of this, and we'll talk about these as tools, will be things outside the will. You'll list most of your property because there's property you don't have to list. Well, you can list it, but it doesn't really matter if you don't list it properly because it's already set up how it goes. Life insurance policies, if you have those, you've already selected the beneficiaries. Those don't have to be included in the will. We can potentially use those if we need to equalize payments between kids, potentially, or heirs in some way. And there's not somebody's getting an asset of more value than other people. That may be one way to do it. If you have payable on death bank account, you don't really have to select who's getting it in your will. It's already selected when you set it up with a bank. How many people have joint bank accounts? 
You don't have to worry about those. Those are set up with the bank. They go to the person whose name is listed on it with you. How many people know how they have their property held? What title it has? So for the most part in any state, except for one type of property ownership in Maryland, property that's held and it will say on the deed something to the effect as joint tenants with the rights of survivorship. In some way on the deed, that is held in a way to where you don't have to put it in your will. Whoever is listed on the deed with you collects that property next, after your death. And we keep doing that until if there's three people on it, when the last person is alive, they own, they own the property outright and they can pass it on. So up until we get to that one person, it automatically is set in there. The same goes for property that's held by married couples in Maryland. It's called joint, it's called tenancy by the entirety, and it has the same effect. So almost all property that's been bought during marriage is held this way. Other forms of property like tenants in common and anything where there's nothing listing rights of survivorship, you can list in your will. That property passes. Um, inside the wheel, it doesn't pass by what who the next owner is on the deed. I forgot one type of property. Does anybody own property in a life estate? A life estate? I'm going to explain what a life estate is. So a life estate will basically be you hold the property during your lifetime and then it goes to somebody else. It's already listed in the deed. You don't actually own the property, you kind of own the property. You really can't do anything with the property. You can't sell it. You can't. You can lease it, but you need the person who's going to take it over upon your death to also sign for it as well. So there's a lot of things you have to do with this property. It's not that common. Some people use it as a way to be able to pass property on to the an, another generation down the road. So it may go to you, and then it would be set up to go to your kids. Yeah, you can live on it. You could. The other way we see it is if you're in a well, the situation that was discussed earlier where the guy had how many kids from two kids and then he was in the second marriage. So say it's a second marriage, but they each have kids. They don't have common kids. Well, husband may leave it to the wife in a life estate so she can hold it during her life and then it go to his kids upon his death. Because if not, she may pass it on to her kids. And does he want his fa say it's been in the family for three generations? Does he really want it to go to her kids in the end? Probably not. So this is another way we see it a lot with second marriages as a way to support the surviving the spouse who moved into the house as one way. So trusts. They may not be for everybody. There are people they're for, and there are some people that are not for. So if you're reaching the federal estate tax limit, which in this year is $11.4 million for an individual, for a married couple it's $22.8 million. The other way of maybe hitting it is it's $5 million for an individual, $10 million for a couple in Maryland. So if you're getting close to those estate tax limits, you really do want to consider this because there's some way to hide, um, well, not really hide, but to be able to pass along assets without taking on a lot of tax liability. Other reasons may be there's a kid in the family or a child in the family or a family, some, another family member who's disabled and we need a way to take care of them. We can set a trust up to be able to take care of those kids. As we get older, if we do get dementia, we do have something that happens. To, we may be able to have the trust set up earlier as a way to manage our own affairs so when we can't do it. Other ways to do this are there may be common property we want the family to be able to manage as we go along. <clears throat> so it may be able to be set up in a trust. There's a lot of reasons why we would want to use these, but not all of them, not every reason may be a reason to use a trust. There, We'll talk about why here in a minute. And I just threw this in if you wanted the trust language. I'm not really going to talk about it. We come in really two forms that we see. Testamentary trusts are created in the will. That's typically the ones we see for minor children or disabled children in some ways to take care of them. If we haven't done the long-term planning uh, earlier in life. The one everyone looks at and uses is the idea of the living trust. It's created during your lifetime and then 
continues after your death. It's a way to manage assets after you die um, and allows your kids to do that. We'll talk about what probate is here in a second, but it's one way to avoid the probate process so property can turn over to heirs faster. Um, they're revocable pretty much during your lifetime. You have the right to change it whenever. So we go back to that issue, don't like to give up control. You still have control to change it during the course of your lifetime. Once you die, it becomes irrevocable. And that ability goes away. You're the one that created the living trust, so you have the ability to do it. Um, once you pass away, it goes irrevocable. You can't change it. You're no longer alive to change it. Your children can't change it. So, Why do we want to consider these? Well, they avoid probate costs, which I think are about 1% of the total value of the estate in Maryland. How many people own property in two or more states? It's a great way to pass property on without having to go through the probate process in two states. Whereas in practice in Oklahoma, we were in a small town. Um, that was where people who lived either in Dallas or a little bit further south of Dallas would own property. We made a lot of money having to basically do probate for those people that lived in Dallas and owned property in Oklahoma right there having to do their probate process for that little bit of farmland they own. So it's really easy to avoid all of that if you do it. If you become incapacitated in some way, your assets can still be managed. You don't have to worry about that. We'll talk about some other tools you want to have just in case as well. Um, typically, you can distribute property to beneficiaries of your children, your heirs, faster in the end. Why do you not want to consider these? Well, they're expensive in some ways to set up. They might be slightly more than a will. Um, you're going to need a lawyer definitely to draft this one. You're definitely going to need a lawyer to draft a will. This one just might cost you a little bit more money. It's not going to be too much more. This depends on the area where you're at as to how much it's going to cost. And in some cases, expenses can outweigh benefits because if basically you don't have anybody willing to manage it at some point um, without taking a fee, there may be fees associated with this. Because if it's a bank managing it because the kids can't get along and actually figure out how to manage the trust properly, the bank may have to manage it. And that's going to be a management fee on top of everything else. So why might you want to consider a will? How many people like to have control over their property? You have really good control until death. You get to direct property up until your death who gets it. You get to select the executor who's going to basically take the will to court, prove it, and distribute the assets. Guardian, so if you have minor children, stable children who will need somebody to take care of them, you get to do that. Once the property is distributed, it goes away. We're done. You have to probate it. You have to go to court. You have to prove it's real. There are challenges that could happen depending on the size of the estate. You can easily put in a no contest clause, but really, if you're, we don't set it up right and it's a big enough estate, people will still contest it. They go to court, and the, one of the, the easiest one to always do is we go back to the example of if one of the kids takes mom or dad to the attorney's office and has to answer all the questions, and the other kid got cheated, it feels like they got cheated, they'll take it to court and say, and eh, they were under undue influence of mom, that's, or of X, that's why mom did that, so we need to go back and have the court reevaluate the will. And that's when we have to bust out the videotape and do all this stuff to prove it. It's not going to go anywhere. It's just they're upset. They didn't understand how. Yeah, and the estate's going to have to pay a lawyer to defend itself, too. So the estate starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller the more contests we have. So for the most part, most people estates will really never be contested. It's only when we get to a certain size that they're going to be contested. But the other point is, if we communicate throughout all this process, we take away a lot of the issues that could arise with contesting. If children understand why 
one person's getting treated one way and another person's getting treated another way, they're less likely to contest. It takes time to do this. It's a public process. This will goes on file in the courthouse. Um, people can go in and look at it. I had yet to figure out why you would want to go into the courthouse and look at a will until, I think it was Christmas, it was Christmas time, someone that farmed near my parents in Oklahoma passed away. He had no kids. It really was this weird thing where everybody just wanted to figure out how he divided his estate. So my parents, I looked at my parents and they were gossiping on this and I went, you know you could go to the courthouse and look this up. My dad went, I may do that tomorrow. And I was like, you're the first person I've ever known in my life that I thought would want to go look a will up. But he actually had a fairly large estate, so that was part of the reason why they were wanting to see how it was being divided up. It's also very state specific. For the most part now, most wills, if they're done in one state, will meet the qualifications in another state. But if you have property in multiple states, you really do want to make sure that will will work in every state where it could have to be probated. And you're going to have to probate this thing in multiple states, depending on how much property you own. And for the most part, it's only real property we're concerned about in other states. Personal property in other states is assumed to be property in the state you live in, not the state where it was set. So if you have a house with a boat in Pennsylvania, the house and the land will all have to be probated in Pennsylvania. The boat will be probated in Maryland. Any of the fixtures in the house will be probated, or any of the non-fixtures like the sofas, the stuff like that, the, the stuff in the house will be probated in Maryland as well. What are the pros of a living trust? Well, we don't have to go through probate anymore. Probate does not exist with a living trust. None of this is public. It's a private document. None of this is ever seen. Some people like this feature of trust. It's very difficult to contest these. If I'm not a member of the trust, I'm not under the trust, I can't claim anything. I take away that ability at that point. Really no need for guardians to hold assets for minors at this point, mainly because we've set a trust up to do all that. The trust can manage the assets for the minors, and the guardian doesn't have to do that anymore. There's potentially trustees, fees associated with this if we have to have a company manage it and pay the fees. For the most part, family members typically will not require that. It does add some asset, complex management to, asset management complexity to the, to the equation, but it's not enough. Typically, sometimes we still have to coordinate it with other estate planning tools. When we talk here in a minute about durable powers, attorney, health care directives, those things, we still have to have those. We may still need life insurance, depending on what the terms of the trust are as to how property will be divided. We still have to do this. Oh, yeah, and you still need a will. There's always going to be property. For the most part, the will will say something as simple as any property that was bought and appears to be outside the trust should actually just be passed through the trust. It's pretty easy to do, but you still have to have it. Any questions so far? I'm covering a lot of information. There's no executor in a trust. There's just the trustee and the trustor and the grantor, so the trust trustees will manage it at that point. Yeah. So and you can make them the same person in the, the other will, the will that would be associated with the trust. So the other things you have to do about this, we got you in the attorney's office, you're thinking about, you know, what you want to happen with your estate and all that. We're going to have you think about, okay, who do you want to handle your business and financial assets? If something happens to you and you become incapacitated, which child do you trust the most with the checkbook and the credit cards and everything else associated with it? This power lasts until either you revoke it or you die. Once you die, you can no longer give this power up and we move into the probate process and other processes, depending on the thing that's done. Um, I'll move on to the next one. Healthcare proxy, same idea with a durable power of attorney, except we're making healthcare decisions at this point. Um, you give the authority to make, you know, whatever decisions that your primary doctor may determine you need. If you become incapacitated, you go under anesthesia. You need somebody to make decisions for your health care while you're under it. Something happens to you. That's potentially one reason why we would do it. Um, typically, they're, they're pretty limited. You do not have the right to make life-sustaining decisions if you have authority um, in some of Earlier ones, they may have actually been that broad, but for the most part, they are not that broad anymore. 
Um, so which kid do you care about the most to make your health care decision? Who did you love the most as a child that will make the best decision for you? As I always point out to my parents, I am the one that needs to be that have the durable power of attorney. I am not this kid. That's my sister. My sister is the caring one. I care, but I care in a different way. I am not the one that wants to be saddled with these decisions to have to make. My sister should have, my sister would do better at this than I would. We're not even going to bring our brother into this. He should probably not make any of these decisions. I'm really glad this is recorded and he will never hear it. <laughs> How many people have, I asked this question earlier, but for those that have the living will or the advanced health care directive, basically it's a specific set of instructions that if you become incapacitated in this manner, what type of sustaining treatment would you like to receive? Would you like to be resuscitated? Would you not like to be resuscitated? Would you like to be put on life support? Would you not like to be put on life support? Typically you'll check boxes. You really don't have to write a lot. The form, the statute tells us what the form should read like, so we just basically copy the statute in most states. Typically, this document specifies medical treatment you want in certain situations. Why is this important? Why is it important to have one of these documents? Have you already made decisions at this point? Your kids have to make decisions at this point. How stressful is this situation going to be for your kids at this point? Or how emotional, not really stre stressful and emotional at this point. So at this point, you've already made these decisions. Nobody has to make these decisions for you. You've done it. So you take the burden off your family. Your family may not like the decisions you made, but in most things that you've done in your life, have either of you gotten along on the decisions you made in your life? Maybe not, maybe sometimes, but for the most part, it takes that burden off. And, you know, regardless of what we think about that decision, we should respect it enough to let, not worry about it at that point. Um, you've already made these decisions now when you can't make them. So it's one way just to get the decision making over with and take the pressure off the family. Some other things we need to think about. I put this in here for farms. I'll put it in here too because there's still stuff that's associated with this that works for you. You know, there may be a business in some way associated with the property. There may not be, but if there's some sort of you know, bank account information that people need access to and everything's online, how do they access the bank account? Where's the password to get into the account? And there are services that will help list all this together for heirs so they can get access to it at some point. If there's social media accounts or some sort of business and you're the person with all the social media accounts, we probably should pass that data on. Um, there are no laws that tell us how to do any of this for anyone curious. And in some cases, this may actually violate the user terms of the, of the agreements you sign with either your email provider or some, some other group. So there are issues associated with this that create large problems when we're trying to pass on information to the next generation in the way that it's probably currently being the most stored. With our remaining time, I'm going to do a little bit on tax, but the thing I want to point out is I'm not a tax expert. If you have detailed tax questions, check with an accountant. They're going to be better than me. I know the basics. Let's talk. I've already talked about what the federal estate tax exemption is, but it's pegged to inflation, which means it goes up every year. It's $11.4 million this year. In 2020, it will be slightly higher. So it's $22.8 million, $22 million for a couple. I need to point out one thing. Um, this is not permanent. It goes away in 2025. I believe it's 2025. It will revert to $5 million plus whatever it should have been with inflation by 2025. So it may be close to $6 million at that point. So if you're counting on this to be the estate, this to continue on, we don't know because we don't know what Congress is going to do. And if any of you know what Congress is going to do, please help me figure out what the next winning lottery numbers are after this. Because you have a lot more ability to tell the future than I do. The other thing that is now in federal law and has been there pretty much since 2012 is this idea of portability. 
The surviving spouse can use any of the unused estate tax, federal estate tax that the predeceasing spouse did not use. For the most part, all property passes to a surviving spouse tax-free. Don't pay any estate tax on it. It's only the property that passes to other heirs that we may have to pay estate tax on. You have to file appropriate forms, which typically do your accountant will do. And the most major thing is never get remarried. Never get remarried if this is a part of your plan. Because once you get remarried, you're no longer a surviving spouse. You're a new spouse. And this does not impact your life anymore. Marriage. Maryland has portability now. This is the first year there's been portability in Maryland estate tax issues. In 2018, the General Assembly set it at $5 million. It's not indexed to inflation. In fact, in 2019, we were supposed to go to the federal estate tax exemption limit, but when Congress changed the tax law in 20, late 2017, the General Assembly came back in the next session and said, we do not want to go to $11 million. We're going to stay at $5 million. That's where we thought we were going to be at. That's where we're staying at. So at this point, it's going to be $5 million for a while. But you do get portability, so there is the ability to have about $10 million in a state tax exemption if you're married. The other thing you can do, which comes into play in this, and it's something people should talk to accountants about and attorneys about to kind of figure out what's the best strategy in all this. There are issues with gifting and there are issues not with gifting. But in, I say 2018, it's the same in 2019. It doesn't change all that much. In 2019, the estate or the gift tax is $15,000 or $30,000 for a married couple. So you're allowed to give to each individual up to $15,000 tax-free. Anything over $15,000 counts against the estate tax exemption. So you can reduce it or you can pay taxes on it. It just depends on what you want to do and what your strategy is. But anything you go over is potentially going to reduce that $11 million down. So we need to think about this. This is where attorneys need to get involved and lawyer or and accountants need to get involved, especially if you're using this for tax benefits. They need to be aware of what to help you plan better as to how you gift. I think I have a slide here to talk about why we would gift in a minute. Yeah. Yes. I was only, or you would calculate it just to make sure you're under the 15000 for each individual each year. If you're way under that, then it's never going to count against that estate tax exemption. That wasn't the question? Okay, I misunderstood the question. Uh, there are two separate tax exemptions, and it only becomes a problem once you start gifting over that 15000 Then it could potentially reduce down the federal estate tax exemption to where it may impact how you pass assets on further. Or am I, am I not? Yes, each year. Yeah, each year. Yeah, they're two separate taxes. Yeah. 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 And I should go back and hit on this. It, this does pay to inflation as well. It goes up to the nearest thousand dollars whenever it rounds up. So it's been fifteen thousand dollars for about two years. It takes a while to get up to sixteen. One of the reasons why we might want to do this is there are ways to do some of this with business entities, and I use the farm example because that was the one I was most comfortable using. 
But if we have people who potentially want to be associated with the property and who don't want to be associated with the property, we can pass set up an ownership with either an LLC or a corporation to where part of the ownership of the whole property resides with all the heirs, but there's classes of ownership. So whoever's going to manage the property, they get full control of the property. They get that management share. Everybody else just gets a small participation share where if the property makes money, and I'm about to knock the flag over, that's not good. Um, they may just get, if there's rental payments on the property or something like that, they get the money off of it, but they don't have any management decisions in the property. So the, so the money would only come into play if, if the rental payments or whatever the payments are in the property exceed whatever it costs to manage the property. So if we're losing money on it, they may not have to put money into it, but they may have to do something. These things can be used in certain ways to facilitate transfers slightly easier. We kind of talked about conservation easements. I use those slightly in the farm context again. But if we have, you know, the potential where one heir is getting a larger share of something compared to the other heirs, one heir is getting the property and another heir is not, we could potentially put conservation easements on it to manage the pro or keep the property the way we want it to be kept way we think it should be kept. We want it to stay in either forest or ag or open space. We can use these in a way to do that, but at the same time give that money to the heir that may not be getting as much of the assets as the other heirs are. It's one way to kind of equalize things up. Go back. So if you get a purchase easement, you'd have the money from the easement. Yeah, sorry, I should have said purchase easement and all that. Donated easements, it would have no benefit. So it would be more a purchase easement program than a donated easement. I should have made that clarification. Sorry about that. The other thing I always point out in this, even if it's farm, even if it's not, how many people know what sweat equity is? you go out, help manage the property, help clean it up, help take care of issues on it, and you don't get paid properly for your time on that piece of property, you've now put sweat equity into the piece of property. And I often use the example, how many people have seen Monty Python in the search for the Holy Grail? This actually does make sense. If you've seen the scene where the king comes out and points out the window and looks and says, lad, all this one day will be yours. In England, that makes sense. We know how property exchanges. It always goes to the oldest son in that, in this, at least in this context, it did. Does it work that way in America? If this is not in some kind of agreement where you're going to get the property, you don't get the property. It may go to whoever it says in the will or it may go to whoever it goes to um, in, you know, under state law if there is no will. So really the idea is if you're taking care of the property with the thought you're going to get the property, Maybe there should be an agreement that kind of already specifies how this is going to be done, either through the will or we at least pay people what they're worth when they're actually taking care of the property so they don't get the expectation that they're supposed to be paid. Because this is really hard to figure out. If you don't know how much, what the value change was because of that work, it's really hard to figure out and it's really hard to go back and figure out later. Yeah. That's the other time that would come up. I drove mom or dad to the doctor every week. or Yeah, that would be another case where sweat equity come up where you think you're owed more than what the will may actually give you. And it may be too late at that point to kind of equalize some of that out. But the children should at least sit down at that point and have a conversation about what is brother or sister's time worth to do those issues? What happens if somebody gets married and, you know, during this whole process? What did Kanye West teach us, folks? He hasn't really taught us much lately, has he? <laughs> but in a song, he taught us all that if we are not chumps, we holler, we want prenup, we want prenup. They are not just for the rich. But at some point, I say business, I meant to put, pro I thought I'd change that to say all property, but if we want to make it clear that the spouse coming into this is not going to get the property or be associated with the property, 
maybe we should just have them sign a prenup early on. I don't want to have this conversation at that point, but if any of you want to, it's something you do should think about if you really have the goal that you don't want spouses involved in this. For the most part, property, as long as it's a gift to one of the children, typically is not considered marital property, so it wouldn't go to spouse. This would just make it slightly cleaner that we didn't want it. There's another more important reason why we might want to consider a prenup. Or if we have a complex family where husband and wife both have children from previous marriages and no plans for additional children. First spouses have passed away, they get married late in life, they're not going to have kids. Or we also have the Brady Bunch. If we think about it, at some point, did they ever have kids in the show together? They just had their kids from their first marriages, right? So what happens if Mike passes away? Does he really want his property going to Carol's three girls? Or does Carol want her property going to Mike's three boys? And if we don't think about it in the TV show context, we think about it in a regular family context I talked about earlier, we may not want certain family property of his to end up over here. We may actually want it to go here. We see this more in complex families where it's a second marriage later in life and people just sign it early on saying, I'm giving up any claim to any property I might have, and he's giving up any claim he might have the property. So in the end, it's basically trying to take away and do some estate planning early on. It could put, it's a, whatever she has, if it says it goes to her girls in her will and his boys don't get anything, they may not like their stepsisters anymore. and might have carried grudges at that point. So this just makes it a little bit cleaner. The main reason I should point out why this is important is in most states, the surviving spouse has the right to elect to a certain amount of the estate. Basically, the reason we do this is to take away the right of the surviving spouse to elect to any of the estate. Typically, the surviving spouse, if they don't get 50% of the estate under the will, can elect 50% of the estate under the will, regardless of what you wrote in the will. So we do this typically to get rid of the surviving, that spousal election and disclaim it automatically. Mm -hmm. Repeat that question one more time. I think I caught it. You, so, surviving spouse wants all the stuff she got to go to her kids? Um, it, yeah, it could potentially do that, especially if she elected to take more of the estate and there was nothing in there to stop her from taking part of the estate. She could still pass it on to her kids and not on to his kids. She could cut her, his kids out totally. If you have the, the prenup, you can't do that. It makes it harder to do. Yes. Okay. I'm not saying any more. Huh? I said don't get remarried late in life. Yeah. Well, they were still in the, they were they weren't that late in life. They're not that married, but yeah, continue on. I'm not saying that because it might be recorded, but um, no, it's still okay to get married. If you're going to get married, though, you should at least take some precautions to, to make sure that this stuff, because if the, I mean, if the goal is a state plan, if the goal in the end is certain things are supposed to be done to where you want them to go a certain way, and these are things people don't normally think about at this point in their life. 
they're not worried about this. They don't take this into account. So they're probably going to get remarried anyway without taking into account. But typically the people that are taking this into account, it may be a business that's being associated with the property. It may be family property. It may just be that that's what they taught. They have a buddy that's an attorney and the attorney told them to do it. So yeah, you can get remarried. It's just you should think about how it's going to impact further things that you need to consider, like either the estate plan or how to treat your kids. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying not to answer the question. Because there really is no right answer to it. Yeah. Okay. So why might you want to reconsider, revise, evaluate all of this estate plan? What are things that can happen in life? Could somebody get married or could somebody give birth? Could somebody die? Could somebody get married? Could somebody get divorced? Could somebody get disabled one day? What happens if any of these things happen? And it's your estate plan and they're in your estate plan. Might you need to revise your estate plan? What if they were going to be, you know, what if the person that passes away is the person that has your durable power of attorney? You typically make three selections in that. What if you don't like, what if selection number two no longer exists and passed away or is disabled now and can't even make these decisions? We really have to start thinking about, okay, we got to update this thing. We may have to evaluate it. We may have to revise it. What happens if you buy more property? What happens if you get rid of property? What if you need to sell it because you, you know, you have some major purchase you need to make, medical treatment you need to make. You have to sell a piece of property. And that's a key cornerstone of your estate plan. What happens if there's a major legal change? What happens when estate taxes potentially at the federal level drop to five plus inflation million dollars in 2025? Is that a major legal change? Is that going to impact some people's estate plan? Good. Maybe we should just do this on a regular basis, talk to the family, figure out if stuff's working. How many people create a perfect plan the first time? Let's not be truthful because all of us think we create perfect plans the first time. But all of us don't. There's going to be issues as these things arise, especially if we're looking at how to manage something, a resource or anything. We may think we know what we're doing, but once we get it in, implemented, we may figure out we're wrong and we need to reevaluate the situation. So I use the tax situation as something that we may want to, as a reason why we might want to consider it. But there are other reasons we might want to go in and reevaluate these things and keep them consistent and be updated. And I think I got done right when you told me to get done. So it's like eight minutes longer than I wanted to go. <laughs> So do your kids have, do you, do you have grandkids in this situation, in this equation? At that point, typically when we write them, we say it, then it would have to be managed by a person. So typically with wills, they'll say, and if my children, these heirs aren't alive, they'll go to their heirs in either equal shares or first therapies or some certain ways that will tell us how we should divide, divide this property up among your heirs. You're now getting to need a law school examples where we would just kill a whole carload of people off at one point. The other question that comes up is what happens, you know, what happens if the, your car accident idea and we have husband and wife in the car accident at one time and one dies at like one minute and then the next one dies at one minute. How do we figure out how to handle that situation? There are so many weird things that could happen that the will tries to take into account in those cases. The will will have a lot of language that tries to take into account some of the weird situations to make sure that property does go. If there are no grandkids, then potentially we would 
blood relatives. Typically, they'll say something like that, that it's supposed to go to blood relatives after that. So it may go to your siblings, your parents, if they're still alive, um, distant cousins, if they're still alive. So typically in those situations, the will is set up to handle it, but catch-all language that you can change, depending on. Or you can donate it to charity once we get to that point. <clears throat> 